that bumper tells us that it's time to have our discussion on State of the Nation. None of the stories we'll be looking at um, is the one that has just aired on ODM. But let me introduce my panelists this morning um, before we continue our discussion. Andrew Flank. Uh, Andrew Franklin, who is a security analyst. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. um, we're also joined by Peter Kaluma, who is the MP for Homer Bay Town, mm -hmm. Santisana. Mm -hmm. And we also have Nicholas Kumbo, who is the MP for Arieda. Thank you for joining mm -hmm. us this morning. Okay, so why don't we begin with um, security, actually. That's something that we've been talking about this week. Um, we, we saw uh, the day before yesterday in Kayseri being nominated to be the CS for Interior. Let me just begin with you, Kaluma. Do you think this is the way to go? Do you think that change will make a difference in how we, we look at security in this country? The problem with our security is a problem of the entire system. No, not really Kimayo or uh, the Minister for Interior. So, so with the greatest honesty, I wanted to say looking at the entire system, Kaiseri or those changes we are talking about are scratches on the back of the issue. They will not deliver anything. And in fact, if we were to go deep, the, the attacks we've been seeing are from terrorists, no, not internal you know, security arrangements. The, the, the police, our internal systems have a problem, but really there is an issue around our defense strategies and how we secure our borders and, and deal with those uh, resources. Franklin, so, I'm seeing you nodding. Do you agree yeah. with uh, Kaluma? Well, I think that uh, <coughs> uh, replacing two individuals um, is, is just a very weak start until we uh, determine that uh, we're going to reorganize our police services in accordance with the National Police Service Act of 2011. So we have a consolidated command structure. Also, we need to look into closing the border with Somalia, Somalia border control project involving the National Youth Service building military-grade roads, fencing. Uh, I was up in Tel Aviv for the Homeland Security Conference with the late with the previous cabinet secretary for our interior, uh, as well as the cabinet secretary for defense, who seems not to be mentioned very often. And <clears throat> the Israelis have a, a, a wide range of both higher tech equipment and also a different perspective on using people. Uh, <clears throat> so with a combination of, of fencing, uh, using the 12th Engineer Brigade to lay uh, minefields, and introducing uh, remote sensory equipment, some of the high-tech things, and also using our resources that we already have in the Kenya Forestry Service with their Cessna, which is equipped mm -hmm. to detect uh, illegal logging in forests and, and charcoal production at night. In other words, that can catch uh, Al-Shabaab crossing the border. It's, these are heat signatures. Uh, and we all, so by reorganizing the police, <clears throat> by establishing border controls, spending roughly the same amount of money we're spending on this Safaricom surveillance project, mm -hmm. but putting it into physical planning, barrier planning, uh, equipping our, our administration police mm -hmm. adequately to respond to intelligence. Okay, uh, but a lot of what you're saying, I think, is what went into consideration before the Prevention of Terrorism Act was passed, Gumbo. And so where are we going wrong? Is it the legislation that is not working? Do we not have people to implement it? Or are we, as Kenyans, not interested in our own security? Well, it's a much bigger problem, thank you. Uh, of course, you must understand that from where we are right now, our uh, security system is, to say the least, very confused very disorganized and in my view dysfunctional and incapable of protecting us. That is the truth. And uh, it's a number of issues. If you look at, for example, <coughs> the, the Jubilee administration, look at the security when they, they, they unveiled the blueprint. They said the security would be the first duty, security and keeping Kenyan safe. And one of the problems, like he has said, was to enhance the border security to work with the countries that border Somalia, because the biggest problem that we have had uh, is, is this infiltration from Somalia. We have not seen any of this happening. They promised a shake-up of the NIS. Of course, the, 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 the head of the NIS was removed, but even the aspect of removing him, one, I mean, we, of course, on where, from where we sit, we still ask whether that really entirely complied with Article 238 of the Constitution. So it is a systemic problem, and for me, really, uh, replacing Olelenko with Kaiseri is, is a worrying trend. How do I say this? Of late, Kenyans have seen serious militarization of internal security. 
and from where I sit, a lot of this is unconstitutional. What happened in Capedo, for example, deploying the army in what was largely an internal security matter, for me, I think that was unconstitutional. So it is a systemic problem, and we need to look at the system entirely, right from information. I think the weakest point that we have in Kenya mm. is information gathering. Look at the NIS. To what extent has the NIS mutated in tandem with the mutating trends of crime and terrorism in general. We still use, for example, the other day I was being told that in Isili, you have one INIS officer who does not even speak the Somali language. Mm -hmm. And yet we know <coughs> that a lot of the people who are there are speak the Somali language. So really, these, some of these things, like he rightly says, we are using good, throwing good money after bad projects. I was one of the people who opposed strenuously the Safari project, not because it was not good for the country, but because we are using good money, throwing good money at a wrong project. Okay. You will uh, put cameras in Nairobi. How does that protect the borderline with Somalia? So, do you think we're completely yes. missing the point? I think we are missing the point completely. All right. Um, I do have to say at this point that we had invited a Jubilee representative to come and speak with us, Kimani Shomwa, who unfortunately is unable to make it. But just continuing the conversation and the debate, um, we're seeing that the policy is not working. What we have strategically is not working. As Gumba is mentioning, our border points are still very open. But um, we had a story just now that Ethiopia is getting it right. Mm -hmm. uh, How are we not Edith, learning? Edith, uh, Ethiopia got it very wrong in 2006 when when with the uh, encouragement of the United States and the certain public and, humiliation and, no the encouragement of the United States mm. to invade Somalia Ethiopians invaded Somalia they threw out the Islamic Court Union mm -hmm. which had actually managed to to impose some degree of control and not as with the same fundamentalist zeal as al-Shabaab, which was an offshoot, ultimately, of the, of the Islamic courts union. But the Ethiopians ended up getting thrown out. They took tremendous losses. They may have uh, caused any number of civilian deaths. And they left. They left. The fact that they have recently rehatted as part of Amazon is just simply, uh, it's, a, it's good for their budget, for their military budget. It's good for their prestige internationally. But they've been sitting in that area anyway. They happen to have uh, locally recruited Somali militias who are not affiliated with the Somali National Army necessarily, who seem to be much more competent than our allies in the Ras Kamboni area mm -hmm. or in Jubaland. In other words, the Ethiopians also have been dealing with their own internal insurgency, with their own Ethiopian Somalis in the Agadan. They fought a war with Somalia. They beat the Somalis in that war. It's a very different dynamic on their border with Somalia. Uh, I think uh, what, what the, uh, your, the interviewee mentioned, uh, I'm going to, uh, was correct when he pointed out that the Ethiopi the Somali population in the Agadan since the war in the late 70s has been much more integrated into Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a strong federal system. Okay. And this is very important because we've marginalized our Somalis. The, Ken the Kenya Somalis have been left out of the national, uh, of national life pretty much since independence. I see you widening this debate to include um the region to have a look at what's happening comparatively and we're hearing in west africa the countries there the nation saying we're going to have a united force and they're going to battle for us in the way that nato does kaluma do you think this would be an effective solution in kenya if we said to museveni and then we said to uh, tanzania let's bring our troops together let's fight the al-shabaab collectively mm -hmm. franklin is already saying no <laughs> it would be the worst strategy to have because you know how the command system of, of the military and the security apparatus work of course that is not the way to go. What I wanted to say is that if, if you go and uh, hit Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the way we do, you expect them to be displaced and you expect them to be scampering across the borders. Now when you hit them there, but you have no border arrangement in terms of how to secure your territory. Mm -hmm. When you, you hit them from there, but in the northern frontier you don't have even a road you can move on to hit back when they come splashing into our country. You're wasting time. Look at the last two weeks what is happening in our military. And I'm sorry to say this because we have to be very sensitive about, you know, matter security. But how many people have we seen being court-martialed 
and that I'm being subjected to life, in fact, sentenced to life imprisonment in the last two weeks, there is something that speaks to the nation. I mean, there is some obvious discontent. I wanted to tell you that we have removed Kimayo, for instance. Mm -hmm. But I can predict for you where his replacement will come from. I may not know the person, but that is how simple. You know, we are running the issue of security. Okay. And what I wanted to say is that security is really a consequence of factors, not, 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 not what causes things to exist. So I like that you've intimated on, you know, the regions and what we're seeing happening with, for example, the replacement of the CS. Gumbo, do you think we are over-politicizing the issue mm. of security? Uh, to some extent, yes. I think we are because, uh, and, uh, and, and this is quite, quite unfortunate. You looked at, for example, with all due respect, when Pekitoni happened, with the utmost respect, I think the first statements that came from the highest security organs of Kenya were very unfortunate. First of all, they later turned out to be incorrect. If they were trying to look at the political angle of things when in reality there are issues there. He has just mentioned the, the, the issue of why, for instance, is it that Ethiopia, by the way, has a longer border with Somalia than Kenya? Mm -hmm. And these Ethiopian Somalians are actually more than Ethiopian Kenyan Somalis. But Ethiopia has somehow managed to... And the question then becomes, why is it happening there and not here? And if you ask me from where I sit, part of the biggest problem that we have had... I, the first time I went to Garissa was in, in the mid-90s. And you know the question they asked me? How is Kenya? Mm. They don't feel that they are part of this country. Mm -hmm. The level edit of degradation in those areas is not acceptable. We have not done enough to make these people feel that they are part of us. I would expect, for instance, for now, that what would be happening, as like the interviewee I just said, that we'll be having covert recruits uh, 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 from the Somali community trying to infiltrate the Al-Shabaab, trying to gather intelligence for us. But when you go, I can tell you, if you go to Mandela now, you probably find the NISS fish over there would be a lure like me, a Kikuyu, or a Kalenjin. What the hell is he doing there? He's not able to even understand what is going on in Abarasa. So we must move with the trends. Okay. Yes. Speaking of trends, I'm yeah. hearing a lot of criticism towards the government, especially from opposition. Um, is there a deficiency then in collaboration? Because there's an idea that if perhaps both the opposition and government come together, then this issue would be um, more efficiently and decidedly sorted. Um, do you think so, Kaluma? Uh, certainly. You know, it is something we've always proposed because, you know, it, when there is insecurity, when you have a grenade thrown onto a vehicle or a public place, it does not choose whoever is in uh, the, the government party or otherwise. It affects everybody. I mean, look at the first Mandela attack. The majority are from Western Kenya. Others are from, you know, Kisi. Others are, and, and you've watched them on news. Secu insecurity does not choose. And that is why you remember we did propose at the time that really you have the instrument of power you have the time to run the country but let us dialogue we are not completely blank simply because we never you know uh, took over government let us sit together let us sit on the round table of, of nationhood and really let us have these proposals what does the government uh, you know side think it is our chance it is our opportunity to do as we will okay and so I let can, me get I you right are you saying the government is isolating everyone else when it comes to the security issue yep. they want to do it alone big time and they are doing it so badly and then i can tell you in a manner that is demotivating you know even our people in the security forces i can i can tell you and allow me to say this huh? during the time of president Mowi, who was in charge of intelligence gathering as a person from central kenya mm -hmm. national youth service was a court the police was a new and, and, and of course you had people from all tribes that are up there. What is this motivation for people coming from those regions not favored to work so hard in the, in the military or in the police knowing there is only so much they can go? There is no motivation. It is so predictable. It's so basic. It is so, I mean, so, 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 so discriminative in the manner we, we, we apply a matter as important as security and a matter really affecting all of us. Well, that's a very strong statement you're making that systemic tribalism could be a cause to insecurity. Big time. Um, do you buy this, Andrew? 
Well, I'm, I'm somewhat reluctant to get involved in that because in my 33 years of living in Kenya, I found that tribe and politics have become intertwined where I've, I seldom, I have seldom seen any differences in policy, between, uh, regardless of which uh, party's in power, uh, which coalition is on which side of the political divide. Everyone's in favor of free, free education. Everyone wants to fight maternal mortality. Everyone wants children to live mm -hmm. past age five. We were supposed to have clean water by the year 2000. No one disagreed with that. Universal uh, truth. In other, word, in other words, uh, I, from, from my position as a, as a resident outsider, perhaps, I have not seen much difference once people get into power with what they do with them. We have excellent security legislation. Mm -hmm. Not as good as I might have wanted it, but, I, but all my ideas I sent to Charles Mitchell at the CSE, a lot of them did get into the legislation that was passed by the 10th Parliament in August of 2012. The fact is we simply have not implemented the laws that we have uh, and worked with the laws we've had. The National Police Service Act, if you're talking about community policing, there's a whole chapter on, on recruitment of reserves, mm -hmm. proper reserves. In, in the devolved system, in, the, in our 2010 Constitution, the governor was supposed to, and in the National Police Service Act that came out of that, the governor is, head, is chair of the county security, security uh, authority, right? Uh, the reservists come from the community. That's called community policing. We don't need the UN and the NGOs to run seminars, and we don't need to send people to go see how people are doing community policing in Denmark or Norway. Mm -hmm. we, but we don't have a properly organized reserve in accordance with the National Police Service Act. IPOA, the Independent Policing Oversight Authority, has identified problems in the police organization, their inability to respond to genuine actionable intelligence provided by the National Intelligence Service prior to Impeccatoni. Now, you may remember, Edith, that on, on June 17th, when the unfortunate statements were made that it was not Al-Shabaab, I, I was asked to come on KTN Prime, where I said it had all the hallmarks of Al-Shabaab, mm -hmm. uh, because I mentioned that the MRC has, has a very ineffective armed wing, and the MRC is, anyway, in any case, a legal organization. Mm -hmm. uh, they have different recruitment patterns along the coast. Uh, it is not an Al-Shabaab clone. Al-Shabaab recruits very differently here in Kenya than they do in Somalia. Uh, I think the, the, uh, we have to work with the people we have now. I believe Major General Camaro, from, who was previously the Director of Military Intelligence, is a, was an excellent candidate yeah. for the new Director General of NIS. But we must insist, we must insist that um, uh, that he reformed the NIS in accordance with the NIS Act of 2012. Okay, so then... And this is where we run into this big problem. We now have a vacuum of power in the, in the police service without a, uh, uh, an IG for the next 90 days or so. And yet, when we interview people who want to be IG, will the members of parliament, will we have people being interviewed on the basis of how will you implement the National Police Service Act? Okay, so let's get to that with Kumbo, because we're saying that there's legislation being made, you guys are churning out laws, but they're not being implemented. So where's the disconnect? Edith, you know, largely, security has to reside in our values and norms, any society. You, you cannot, uh, even if you have the best of laws in the world, but your values are going anti the laws, look at ourselves. I mean, a time has come when we must ask the hard questions. For instance, to what extent is corruption in the police force contributing to the insecurity? Mm -hmm. We are being told of sugar imports from Somalia into Kenya, the illegal charcoal trades that are happening with our... This is, this is a UN report. These are not reports that have been done by Kenyans. The illegal charcoal trade in Somalia. How would these things be happening in a society that holds to certain values and norms and wants to live with those values and norms? So, so long as we do not do these things, no matter how good we have had... Uh, uh, by the way, we, we, even if you look, go back, uh, even before we enacted the 2010 Constitution, even the old constitution had provisions which we never <coughs> cared about. Yeah. For example, there was a provision there that parliament had to approve the size of the cabinet. For 40 years, we didn't even look at that. So, no matter how good a set of laws you have, so long as your values 
norms and principles are wrong, we are going nowhere. Okay. I think as a society, we need to look. A society which, for instance, seems to justify undressing of, 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 of our women just because of the way they dress, and people don't seem to find anything wrong with it. We have to ask those questions. Um, I think that's an important point to note, but still yeah. on the issue of security, uh, but a different aspect of it, immigration. It's in all the papers today about the Chinese nationals who were arrested. Uh, 77 of them found, 37 of them arrested. Um, still in the same breath, 88 Ethiopians arrested in Donholm without any documentation, and 15 nationals from an unknown country arrested without any documentation in Anyuki. We're talking about sealing our borders, but are we really looking critically at who is in the country? Uh, we don't. In, in fact, I can tell you, uh, Kenya is one country anybody can come into and anybody can do anything. In fact, I can tell you, this is the one country in the world where foreigners have greater rights than the citizens. Thank you. If, 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 if a foreigner went into a police station and said Kaluma has abused me, I would be arrested immediately. You say anything, a foreigner. And, and by the way, look at even their history. This is the only country where you get a foreigner pretending to run a garage or a mechanic. And, and a car wash. And a car wash. <laughs> why do you have it under the, in the world? You, you are foreigners selling biscuits <laughs> and children's clothing. So in a country, you know, open seeking trade. to be, I mean, open it, trade. It's, it's a joke. <laughs> I think we have opened our borders so much. We have enough laws, but the administrative arrangements need to be firmed up. Because really a time has come when the world is becoming too global and we need to you know, secure our people in as, in as much as we open up. So Andrew, where do we get that um, consensus, that meeting point between globalization and isolation? Because you don't want to then be too open and you don't want to seal yourself off. Well, I would rather uh, look very closely at the role of the media in failing to expose the rot in our immigration system. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I'm sitting here, uh, in KTN, which was uh, which was where the studios were trashed and ransacked by foreigners leading a police squad, where uh, Standard Group was in, in October of 2013 was given a five million shilling token uh, uh, award by Justice Mumby uh, because of the raid on the Laconi Road printing plant, mm -hmm. where the, the entire issue, uh, day's issue was burned. Uh, the Artur Brothers, where, which KTN has featured in, in print, mm -hmm. I mean in, in the big, the big issue, mm -hmm. exposing that there were three or five or ten people who came into the country, one maybe from Armenia, one on a stolen Russian passport, somehow became, uh, somehow became citizens. They became investors. They registered mm -hmm. Kensington. Mm -hmm. uh, Parliament in the Hansard in 2007, well, there is, you can find the report uh, on this whole saga. Paul Mwiti was one of the co-chair mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. uh, members of that particular committee included uh, Njoki Ndungu, who is now a Supreme Court Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Martha Carew was on that, that committee as well. It's available in the Hansard. Uh, these are people who, who, who were able to open bank accounts, who had lawyers certifying their documents, and who admitted in the public uh, inquiry in 2006 that the lawyers admitted, oh, I never met them. I never saw the original documents. Now, I used to sell offshore investments here. Mm -hmm. I used to sell offshore investments here, and I, would have, and I am able to certify people's cop copies of people's documents, true copies, because the companies I dealt with overseas knew that as long as Andrew was here and stamping the copies and, and signing it, saying, I have seen the original, or I have seen a certified copy of this mm -hmm. and before I did it. And yet, the, a public commission exposes the fact that foreigners came in here, somehow one rose to become a deputy commissioner of police mm -hmm. in the reserve, <laughs> the same reserve that Major General Ali had in fact dissolved. Uh, and we all accept it's a ha-ha situation. I would suggest that moving away from Islamic terrorism, Muslim, uh, you know, just looking at how criminals came in here in 2005, made friends with the media, uh, apparently on social media there's all kinds of things about people who, you know, some of the celebrities here. The fact is, we do not know to this day who exactly those guys were, mm -hmm. how they managed to get become, one, become a policeman. In fact, you know, it's almost grotesque because when the, one, one of the auteurs before they were deported were accused of pulling a, 
uh, firearm mm. uh, in the arrivals hall at the airport. Well, that case was thrown out because all the witnesses, that is the police, immigration, and other witnesses were transferred to el elsewhere. But more, more frightening, I believe, is that Mr. Gibson Kamal Korea, who was defending to the best of his abilities, this, this Armenian gentleman, so, pointed out that the CCTV cameras in the arrivals hall had not been functioning for eight weeks. Now that's in 2007, mm -hmm. 2006. Mm -hmm. And then they were deported to Dubai, where that, but you can't deport people to countries where they're not citizens, you see. In other words, that demonstrates the rot. And I have been campaigning, if you will, that, that KTN, the standard group, you know, it could actually make a game-changing campaign mm. here mm. by actually going after the people who burned your newspaper, mm. trashed your studios, mm. and were found by a court in, in the Republic of Kenya to be culpable. Okay. And, and the government was ordered to pay five million shillings as a nominal uh, let me jump in. Let me jump in here, Gumbo. Um, we're hearing the big example being that of their two brothers, but we yeah. also saw how Samantha Luthwaite was able to come into the country on a South African passport. If you had the opportunity today to change immigration, what would be the three key things that you would look at? Uh, I, I think what uh, what he's Andrew's just been talking about is is, is, is the pervasive uh, the, the way the extent to which we have gone in, in, in reversing our national security programs. And, and here he's talking about immigration. How, for instance, were these people able? In fact, what he didn't mention is that while some of the people who have left this country have been denied entry into our VIP lounges, these fellows were able to be ushered into our VIP lounges in full view of the cameras. So I, I think uh, one of the things, uh, Edith, that, and, and this uh, we have said it's holistic, it's a systemic. As a people, we also must look at these things. We are reached a point where we have to ask and really dissect to what extent is corruption uh, uh, dealing a blow to the fabric, the, rot, the general rot in society. Because for someone to have a work permit in Kenya when he's not even, he shouldn't even be in this country somebody has been compromised. So we have to start from the bottom all the way up. If not, and, 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 and if you go back to what the Honorable Kaluma said, replacing Lincoln with, with, with Kaiser alone is not enough. In fact, I, unless something happens to, to really change the way we do things, I, I don't think I said it. But what is, that, what is that something that needs to happen in order for us to change things? The something that needs to happen for us to change, as a people, we have to look at our values and norms. I, I think it is so, so, so important that our values and norms edit are wrong. Some of the things we seem to accept are not acceptable. This is the truth. If you have a society where unacceptable things become the norm, then something has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. As a country, we must look at our values and norms. We must accept that it is wrong to infringe on what ought to be inalienable rights and nobody seems to bat an eyelid. We have to accept that this country will move forward when everybody feels a sense of belonging there's too much exclusion in Kenya at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact. Okay. And, and uh, Honorable Kaluma said that he may not know the person who will take over from Kimayo, but he more or less can predict why is it this way? Why do some people appear more Kenyan than others? When people, I gave you the example of my first visit to Garissa, where I was being asked, how, 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 how is Kenya? Mm -hmm. When people edit feel excluded, from the affairs of their country, they have no reason to want to participate in building that country. And speaking of that exclusion, how do we go ahead and um, deal with this issue of terror, especially coming from foreigners, without um, risking further marginalizing the Kenyans who are here? We're talking about the Kenyan Somalis who we often have to identify as of Somali origin. Mm -hmm. We're seeing in Mwingi, the Star newspaper is reporting that there were protests there and they went into a Somali-owned restaurant. Mm -hmm. How do we fight terror without and seal our borders effectively and effectively um, 
put our immigration in order without risking xenophobia? I think before we even go to that, Edith, uh, one of the other problems that I've seen, and Andrew being a security expert, uh, can look at the way the government, for example, has been responding to cases of, of terror and insecurity. Take the case of Musili, for example. Mm -hmm. There is a problem in Isili. You round up all Somalis. What are you trying to do? Even the people who have good intentions of cooperating with you, get they, they, they get embittered. Look at this, the Capedo the other day. I've, been, I've had a occasion from a flight, the Capedo, the Silali area. That's one of the most God-forsaken. In fact, it is a caldera. It is one of the most God-forsaken. When you go Caped bomb, bombing a place like that, hammering people, even people who are going, what are you doing? Even the same people who would be willing to offer information to you, they are alienated. And they, that, that is the question I'm asking. How do we then make sure that we find the people who are responsible for this without hurting others who are not? You know, th th that is something around our intelligence system. I mean, uh, we are not more, you know, ethnic in terms of the origins of the people than you know great countries like the u.s in fact bigger bigger global you know countries around how do we reach a level where you cannot identify your own people i mean it's about the intelligence machinery and how it works mm -hmm. and of course andre bogumba had spoken to it how do you send a law to be your intelligence chief in his other than that kaluma is earning from being an intelligence chief what can he give you there how can we integrate people? Instead of saying you are, you, 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 this is a mosque, it is not going to operate, how can we have our own people in that mosque to give us raw information on the people causing trouble? Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? So, so it's about intelligence, our strategy around it, and how we gather information and utilize it. Okay. Allow me to jump in there because in the same Star newspaper, it's been reported that the government has actually admitted that there was intelligence which was offered to the people in the recent attack in Mandera, but not, no action was taken. You know, I, I had the, uh, our, our deputy president and I felt very sad. I mean, when you say there was intelligence, people did not hearken to our call to move. When you have intelligence, your people are going to be at risk within their border. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Do you say people are being in, uh, given information to move or you move your own troop to secure your people there? I mean, some things are so, so basic. Right. Let us take people seriously, particularly when you say there is intelligence. I'm worried about our intelligence because every occurrence in which we've lost life and limb, we are talking of early intelligence was there. Uh, yet really, we are coming to not. If intelligence is there, how is that intelligence connecting with the security apparatus to secure people against what you know, the intelligence discovers? I think Andrew is, is best placed to answer that question. How does it work, ideally, from gathering intelligence to securing persons and preempting attacks? Well, ideally, and, and practically speaking, is if we have a reorganized police service mm -hmm. where there's a consolidated command and control system where you get intelligence and that says, Settlement villages in Lamu County are likely targets. A quarry full of Christians, five miles, eight kilometers from the Somali border, is a likely target. The National Police Service, if they are organized, as if the administration police are reorganized, whether it's in platoons or companies, because they are a par paramilitary force. We talk about a rapid deployment unit that we've never really seen the table of organization for that rapid, rapid deployment force. We've never seen, uh, you know, the command structure, how they interact at, uh, well, Vigilance House or BP Shell House, or whatever it's called these days. The fact is that uh, IPOA has said NIS has logs, they show we've sent the information on in Pecatoni. Mm -hmm. The National Police Service is simply not national. It is not a, a consolidated organization. It cannot react mm -hmm. to intelligence. And it seems as if within the police, somebody is sitting on information. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it's, it's a, a bureaucracy which seems to be plagued by inertia. It is not operating off the playbook, which is the National Police Service Act of 2011. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a partisan person, but I, so I will say that Parliament continues to vote 80 billion shillings mm -hmm. a year for the National Police Service, mm -hmm. a National Police Service which is not being transformed in accordance with the law passed by the previous Parliament. Now, that is a, a serious indictment of, of systemic errors, and, and, I'm, and I'm not going to say that uh, one party or the other is, is more culpable than the other. In fact, I'll sit here at the end and say everyone is...
mm. is culpable mm. at this point in time because I'm not on I'm not on the floor of Parliament. I'm not voting. Uh, I can only help if people ask. Right. I would also point out to you that on August 7th, I think I sat here, uh, that's more than 90 days ago, mm -hmm. because uh, with Dan Kazungu and, and the Honorable Derek mm. from Lamu, and we should have had the answers by now to who the directors are of 22 companies that somehow acquired 500,000 acres in Lamu County. I, it's more than 90 days, mm -hmm. and yet the head of CID said it would take 90 days, which I thought was a lot longer than, than was necessary, mm -hmm. because at that time I suggested strongly that we pull the lawyers in who had registered those companies, we take the bankers in and say, give us the application so we can see the names of the directors who actually signed mm -hmm. the form. Anyone who tries to do business in this country uh, and, and tries to persevere is very well aware of how much bureaucracy and, and how much what you have to do to, uh, which is not how much you have to do to open a bank account <laughs> with it for your company. You're, if you try, if you follow the law dutifully, mm. and God help you if you don't, because then you have a silent partner from the government. Uh, you find out how many resolutions you have to have signed, how many how many forms you have to submit to the company or registrar every year. You know. KRA, has KRA been called in about these 22 companies? Are these companies filing their returns with KRA? Are they deducting employees? Do they have employees, in other words? Mm -hmm. Now, I said all this on August 7th, sitting here. And it's uh, 90 days come and gone. Now, these, we cannot encourage business. We cannot encourage foreign direct investment here. We can't even encourage local investment in a, in a place where we can't keep track of people, can't keep track of companies. We go to Washington for some summit. And we talk about how we have a digitized registry of companies because you can send a text message now to mm -hmm. reserve a name. And yet, the reality is the registrar of companies is in shambles. Uh, they are unable to promptly and, and deliver information, even when the president says, I want that, those allocations revoked. And so it goes. Okay. Um, I think I want to seal that discussion there on issues of security. We're going to take a short commercial break. But when we come back, gentlemen, I want us to discuss this issue of um, your party. Could it be that Cod Leader will actually buy for the Homa base and its seat? That's a question I'll be asking when we come back. And also looking at what's happening with Fatou Bensouda at the ICC. We'll be right back after this short break. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 